Joe. Joe on Joe is the only podcast where Joe talks about Joe. And now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hello again, everybody. It's me, your host, Joe Slepsky, and welcome back to Joe on Joe. This is the only podcast where I've covered uh, every episode of the Sunbow cartoon, every episode of the DIC era, even all the extreme episodes of the G.I. Joe cartoon. And we've also gone over all of the uh, comic book issues from Marvel's uh, Real American Hero on the original run. And we've now worked our way through uh, the Action Force annuals. That's right, guys. Today and gals, today is the uh, final part, part three of the G.I. Joe Action Force annual from 1991. Um, I've really been enjoying these Action Force stuff. I'm probably going to end up doing some more of it in the near future. Had a great suggestion from listener Brad, who suggested some of the Blackthorn publishing stuff, which is like the How to Draw and the G.I. Joe 3D stuff, which I think is a fabulous suggestion. I had those when I was a kid. I had almost all of them. As an adult, I completed the set. Uh, they're a lot of fun. There's uh, one of the one of the 3D ones is terrible, so I'm excited to go through that and look at where everywhere they went wrong. But the, the early it was like it was the final one they did. It was really rough. Um, but we're not there yet. But yeah, I'm going to be doing some of the Blackthorn stuff in the in the coming weeks. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's it's uh, Black. We'll cover it through there. But it's they did like specialty books. They did a lot of how to draw books and 3D publication books that not just about GI Joe. They did other licensed properties as well. So. Um, to a small little publishing niche, which we'll talk about when we get there. So that's exciting. If you're new to the show, welcome aboard. Uh, it was a special welcome aboard to uh, Jaden, friend of Toilet Teal. Thanks for listening. Uh, so excited to have you as a new listener. I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, and if, for all of you new listeners, if you want to reach out and say hello, we're on social media at Joe on Joe Pod. It's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can send me an email to Joe on Joe Pod at gmail.com uh, and say hi. Uh, if you want to be a guest on the show, we do a segment called You on Joe, where you are the guest. And uh, one specific thing about G.I. Joe that you absolutely love, we'll do a deep dive into it. You can uh, give me an email shout out there. Uh, and you can also help keep the show afloat with our Patreon, patreon.com slash Joe and Joe pod. Now, um, before we get into a couple other points of business, I want to point out it is Oscar season. Our sponsors are the great movies and a meal podcasts. They got to be talking Oscar stuff. In the beginning of time, the smallest organism gained sentience and thought to itself, I really need a good meal. Then, a bunch of other stuff happened, and finally the Lumiere brothers started showing movies in France. This was all the inspiration that fellow broadcasters Brad, Keith, and Ben needed to combine these two primal needs into the Movies in a Meal podcast. The Movies in a Meal is one of the most casual and relaxing film talk podcasts you could ever listen to. These three friends enjoy a good meal together while talking all about the movies. And not just reviews, they do favorite lists, comparison discussions, genre talks, anything and everything that you can think of. They've even broken their solemn promise inherent in the name and branched out into TV talk. So I love the variety of films they bring to the table. They cover new releases, classics, cult films, often in one episode. It's really a delight to listen to and it has something for every movie fan out there to enjoy. So, if you're looking to grow your podcast library, if you eat meals, and if you've ever seen a movie, then you should give Ben, Keith, and Brad a listen and subscribe to the Movies in a Meal podcast. They've been a great sponsor to this show. I love the Movies in a Meal podcast, and I'd like all of you to love them too. I saw last week they talked about Madam Web. I saw Madam Web. Um, the less said, the better. However, could be a camp classic. There's some there's some awesome line readings in that movie from Dakota Johnson where she don't even want it. She doesn't even want to be on set, let alone her character want to be in that predicament. And it came off pretty funny to me. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't know when we're going to stop the Sony madness with the Sony spider movies. Uh, I know there's Craven still in the works, but oof. Um, anyway, this isn't a movie podcast. This is a G.I. Joe podcast. Uh, and, and I also want to give a quick shout out. So this episode drops, uh, literally on the 21st of February. So that's tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, the Thursday, the 22nd, if you're in the LA area, and I'm sorry for not saying this earlier, we're going to be out watching a magic show 
Uh, Joe and Joe Guest himself, the mind noodler, Matt Donnelly, he's doing a show out here in Los Angeles at the Lyric Hyperion Theater, and we're going to be there. So uh, if you're hearing this on a Wednesday or Thursday morning on the 22nd of February, go to the Lyric Hyperion and snag yourself some tickets to see some wonderfully charming close-up magic uh, by Joe on Joe Guest, Matt Donnelly, uh, who's who was an awesome, wonderful guest, and I can't wait to see the show. Uh, I'll report in next week how amazing it was. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you guys there. There'll be a few of us out there. Um, the other one I want to throw a shout out to our good friends over at the What's on Joe Mind podcast. Uh, th- that podcast has been around forever. I think I think Mike was saying like 13 years or something. Um, it's a great podcast. And, and Mike and Rob and uh, the Honcho, they, uh, they're always welcoming. And, and, and they'll ask me to guest, guest on that show every once in a while. And so... Uh, it's always my pleasure. I always have a good laugh. They, they, their show airs live on Tuesday nights. You guys should, if you're, if you're never heard them, you should check them out. And if you just haven't checked them out in a while, you should always check them out. Cause they're great. They're like the, um, the OGs of the Joe podcasting space. And I appreciate them so much for, so thanks for having me on last week. Uh, and finally shout out to, uh, the PCSM productions who does some wonderful stop motion uh, animated videos. They reached out to me on social and said, Hey man, uh, we'd love for you to do a voice for us. And just this week they dropped their fantastic four stop motion video. It's about five minutes. Um, and I was blessed to play, uh, Benjamin Jacob Grimm, uh, the thing. And I, uh, love playing the thing. I've done it a couple times on a couple different places. And, uh, I love, uh, Ben Grimm's amazing. So, um, big shout out to them. The video is awesome. If you like stop motion, you know, using the action figures, uh, it's really great. Like it's a, they do a wonderful job editing it all together. Like it's a lot of fun and it's, you know, the FF fights, Dr. Doom and Benjamin Grimm gets to get in the mix. And, uh, I loved it. So thank you. Uh, thanks for thinking of me. Uh, we tweeted out the link. You can see it on, uh, I think I shared it on Instagram and certainly on, on Twitter and, uh, put it on the Facebook page. But they're on, uh, they're on uh, YouTube, PCSM Productions. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the SN stands for Stop Motion. So big thanks to them. I really appreciated the opportunity. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So give that a look. Um, I think that's it. That's all That's all the notes I got for uh, cleanup this week. So we're going to be talking about the final part of this 91 annual, which is uh, the actual comic book. We're no, no more prose stories this week. We're actually talking comic books this week. And it's called Piece of the Action. It is excellent. It's a really good story. I like it a lot. And the artwork in it is fantastic. And so we're going to talk a little bit first about uh, the artist on it. So it's written by Dan Abnett and Steve White. Now, we've talked about Dan Abnett and how much I appreciate his work. Uh, you know, responsible. For, he wrote the prose stories in these that we've been reading, but also, you know, uh, a lot of the cosmic stuff over at Marvel. Um, you know, Annihilation, and then that led to Guardians of the Galaxy, which that's the version of the Guardians that is on the big screen. Uh, and also my, uh, he partnered with uh, uh, Andy Lanning for a lot of the stuff. For They were the partner writing partners for years. And uh, they did a, a series called Resurrection Man, which was just amazing. So good. So I've sung his praises before. So I was looking at the artwork on this and I really liked it. And I was like, I don't recognize this name, Stuart Johnson. It's Staz Johnson. Staz Johnson did some great work. You know his work. He did a long run on Robin uh, in the 90s, from like 96 to 99. That is a lot of Robin work. Uh, He also did the Batman Aliens crossover series. He worked over on Wolverine. He worked on New X-Men. He worked on some Civil War stuff. Um what else? Force Works. He was the artist on Force Works, which also worked with Abnett and Lanning. So that's really cool. I never knew that. Uh, he did a, a, a year on Catwoman and he did some detective comics. I've always known his work from Robin and I've always thought his work was really fun and great. This is a different level. This is a real, um, real, real realistic look at air. It's the whole, the old story is a dog fight. It's all in the air with a couple of exceptions. They land eventually, but it's all in the air. So there's a lot of aerial shots of uh, both the, the uh, Sky Striker, you know, an, uh, an F-14, and then the Conquest X-30. And they look great. Like, they look uh, 
real airplane accurate, not even toy accurate. They're certainly toy accurate, but they also look real airplane accurate. And the the um, the posing in this, so the the camera angles, like the the choice of shots that he does in this, must have been using uh, like real aerial footage snapshots to like frame all this stuff. And and I say that because it's so well done, not to say that he couldn't have thought of this stuff on his own. Like it, he does a wonderful job. He also makes the smart choice of using really large panels for, for most of it. There's a couple of pages that get small, but for most of it, these panels are really large on the page, which adds to the scope of grandeur for the story. Um, I liked it a lot. And it's, and it's one of those fun dogfight stories. Uh, we always talk about the ace, uh, Wild Weasel showdown. It was a J.I. Joe 35. We always say how great that story was, and it is. It's that kind of a story, you know, where there's like a duel in the sky. Everyone, you know, like you're, you know, it's going to wrap up one way. There's, you know, like there's not a moral, but there's like a little hook to it. You know, it's not a, it's, it, it's it, dogfight stories in J.I. Joe tend to, tend to go that route. And frankly, they did also in old World War II, like old uh, war comic books. If you read like enemy ace stories, very similar. Like there's this nobility that's portrayed to dogfights or this, uh, and I think for obvious reasons, a real sense of finality to them. Like that's it. Like you have to make this choice and there's no, if you choose wrong, that's it. Either, even if you, if they don't get you and you crash, you're dead. If they get you, you're dead, you know? Uh, and if you win, they're dead. And I think that always permeates almost any, um, Real, you know, well done uh, dogfight aerial dogfight story that I've read, uh, and it's it's certainly here in this too. Um, it's also got a lot of shades of Top Gun in here. So this is ninety one. So this is just you know what five years after Top Gun, four years, five years. So there's a lot of vibes to that. Um, so I really liked it, and I was uh, it was great to see that it was Stas Johnson doing it. It's really good, and it and and frankly, it doesn't look like his Robin stuff. Um. It just looks, yeah, it looks good. And, and most of it is airplane. So most of it is uh, uh, shots of airplane. So there's not a lot of, it's very, it's a very technically drawn issue. You know, there's occasional face shots, which, you know, look great and lots of good reactions and stuff, but it's really very, uh, very technically drawn. So if you, if you didn't do that well and choose these really nice, like imposing angles and just camera setups, then there's no life to these planes. And he does a really nice job with finding life to them. So. Um, kudos, Stas Johnson. Good for you. Uh, yeah, really nice. So, any hoots. That's it. So, let's dig into it. It's called Piece of the Action. Um, we start with a nice half page splash of uh, the Sky Striker screaming at us. Um, it's funny. I, I go on and on about how wonderfully illustrated it is, and it is. But in the first, very first picture of the Sky Striker, there's, uh, like there's bombs and missiles that are missing. Um, there it's, uh, it's, it's weird. It's an unbalanced shot. Like the, the right side of the plane has what's seeming to be the accurate placement of the missiles and the left side doesn't. And, um, it just seems weird because then they're, they're there in the next few panels. So I take, you know, I'll take it back per se, but, um, you know, for dissecting the issue, I got, I feel like I have to address that. I don't, I don't mean it as a complaint. It's a very nice, it's a very nice shot of the sky striker, uh, zooming in through the cloud cover and it's lady J and ACE. They're in the cockpit. ACE is flying. Lady J is his, uh, um, uh, not wingman goose. What was goose goose? Well, cope, uh, it's co-pilot, but what was, uh, what was, hold on. We're going to find out. Hold on. What, what technically did they, that nickname called goose? So, yeah, I used to remember this because, you know, everyone used to love Top Gun. Ray, uh, Goose was his Rio, which is radar intercept officer. So he literally, his job was to look at the radar and, and, and literally look out for other people in the sky to help, you know, the pilot uh, figure out what's up. So that's why he does spend the whole movie going, hey, they're that way. Hey, they're that way. That's what Goose's job was. Um, so in this case, Lady J is Ace's Rio, uh, which is a fun little term. And we're also going to get a really cool little term in the next couple of pages. So there you go. Yo, Joe! And the top panel here is seems straight out of Top Gun. It's you've got the F-14, uh, the Sky Striker. It's it's flying at an angle. It's actually not completely on its side because if you look at the clouds, 
what's really striking about this picture is that he puts the clouds on a tilt too. So the whole picture is on a gimbal tilt. And then the Sky Striker is also on a tilt. And he has these two Conquest X30 basically buzzing the Sky Striker. There's a ton of movement in this top panel. It's a, it's a wide panel. It takes about the top third of the page. And um, Ace loses uh, this match. Apparently, This is also where we learn that they're in a training exercise. And the two X30s kind of buzz him. Therefore, they, he loses the match. Um, Ace gives him a you know nice flying slipstream. I didn't see you there. And... Uh, you know, this is when we confirm it just as well as a training mission. Those conquests are running rings around us, you know, because the, the Sky Striker was the old model. That was the old plane. And Scarlet is the other co-pilot. She tells Slipstream this wasn't so hard when we get a real piece of the action. So Scarlet's hungry for a fight. Um, and Slipstream reminds her to not get cocky. This is another nice shot, aerial shot, where you you put chosen to put this, the conquests in the forefront of this little... Um, it's like a third third of the page tall and uh, about uh, two thirds wide, and you you put the conquests in front of the even though the the simulation so to speak is over, but they're still leading the fight right they're a flight rather they're they're in in front of the X wing X wing <laughs> I'm gonna say that probably a lot they're in front of the Sky Striker, so visually what does that do that puts the Sky Striker as an old model it puts the Sky Striker as you know the loser in this category. Uh, it's the inferior plane because it's it's literally in third place here. So the two sky the two conquests are ahead of the sky striker. So that's a nice choice. You could have drawn them. Um, you know they could have all been parallel, wing to wing. They could have been behind. You know like there's a myriad of ways you could have drawn them. It's not a, like a continuation from that last move. They buzzed him. This is literally they're regrouping and and they're still choosing to draw them in front of the sky striker. So that's a nice little subtle choice. Uh, so that's we learned Scarlet's there. And then now we get a, a really cool shot that is really feels like it's from a Russ Heath um, World War II picture. It's a, it's a close-up of Scarlet in the lower right. And through her cockpit dome, you see uh, you see the other X-30, which is Slipstream. And then behind them, the Sky Striker uh, flying behind that. So you, you get all three, but you don't need to see the – you don't need to see the plane that Scarlet's in but because you know she's in the other X30 uh and it and it just places everybody it gives you a nice close up of Scarlet so you get a little emotion of what she's thinking uh in this case she's thinking about Boredomsville Arizona because uh Ace tells her that the new action force tracking station in Norway they want something to uh try its eyes and ears out on so they're going to buzz over to Norway uh flying in very low and fast and see if the the Norwegian uh action force can pick them up on radar so it's a it's a milk run in Scarlet's board. Yo, Joe! So over in Norway, it's the uh, the Thunderbird flight. And by the way, they're they're called the Thunderbird, like the Thunderbird team. That's what they're called. Um, Thunderbird flight. Uh, this is Norway. Skip the training run. They say uh, we've got four unknown aircraft inbound on an intercept course, uh, and this is a um, it's an establishing shot of like a bunker with a bunch of radar. Uh, kind of in with uh, camouflage over them. So we don't exactly know who that is. We don't need to know, but it's it's the Norwegian um, tracking station. Scarlet asks if it's part of the exercise. Negative, not a drill. And they, we see that they've got four bandits at 15 miles, uh, one o'clock speed, four, five, zero. So they're 450 miles an hour. Um, and we get a little close-up of Scarlet first in the cockpit, kind of looking out to the side, like she's searching the skyways. Uh, and then I think that's Lady J that gives us the bandits. I think it's Lady J on as the Rio there. I don't think that's they, to be honest, they don't really say, oh yeah, she's got a different helmet on colored helmet. Lady J is a white helmet. Scarlet, they have her in a red helmet, which is funny because it's like they're emulating her hair, um, which might literally be why she's in a red helmet. But yeah, so that's Lady J working the radar. So she's working, doing her job as the Rio, everybody. Uh, now we get our final, our finally our first shot of of, of uh, Slipstream, and he calls them Thunderbirds again. He says, let's clean up. He says, this is great. And he must be in charge of this little operation, too, because he's giving the order here, not Ace, which is interesting. It's like the new guy in charge of things, which is kind of cool. And he says, okay, Thunderbirds, let's clean up, pickle off your fuel tanks, and go supersonic. And... Uh, Good storytelling does exactly what's happening here. 
you see a nice, a really good, really well rendered shot of all three planes. They're all, you know, now they're in formation, right? So now they're equals. They're going off to battle. So now they're equals again, right? So they're they're all in formation, and you see them dropping off uh, their fuel tanks. All their the fuel. You remember the Sky Striker has a fuel tank on the bottom. Uh, looks like he has two of them, uh, and the Conquest has each each Conquest had a fuel tank attached to it. So he says, "Pickle off your fuel tanks," and they all drop. Now, if you don't know what pickle like pickle off means, you, you don't need to know because you, the very next scene shows something dropping off, and he says fuel tanks. So you assume that's the fuel tanks. So. Really great storytelling. You don't need what I'm about to share with you. But I was fascinated by that. I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? What does pickle off mean? So I looked it up. So in fighter, pl- fighter planes, and uh, if you've ever seen the, the yoke of a fighter plane, it's um, the red button, and that's their bomb release button. So you've seen it in all the... Um, you know, on the stick of all the fighter planes and all the Top Gun movies we've always seen, right? There's the little red button that they press and their missiles fire or their bombs drop or whatever. Apparently, that's called the pickle button and has been called the pickle button for, you know, almost almost 80 years, right? There's a few reasons why they think it's called that. No one, there's, there's three prevailing things, but they do know what it means. It's called the pickle button and it means to release your payload, drop, you know, to drop off your plane, the payload. So... Here's what this uh, here's what this uh, military website says. Uh, this is from uh, forces.net. Um, it was a a Life magazine article that talked about demonstrating the U.S. precision back in 1943 about bomb dropping, and they referenced it. They said it can accurately drop a bomb from 20,000 feet into a pickle barrel. So that's them assigning it. Uh, the the concept to uh, to the to dropping the bomb into a pickle barrel. So apparently that picked up in slang. But why a pickle barrel? So apparently there was another Life magazine article where they talked about um, the company that made the bomb site, like the later like the site, like literally the crosshair site for for all these airplanes in World War II. Um, they hired Madison Square Garden in New York City for one night to entertain its staff and their families, about 15,000 people. Uh, the traveling circus company Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey, known for putting on the greatest show on earth, had quite the performance planned. It said, quote, the circus did its part by rigging up a bomb site of its own, which enabled a clown to drop a wooden bomb into a pickle barrel. And then a pickle popped out of the barrel. Such deadly accuracy has made the Norden bomb sites the most closely guarded secret in the Allied arsenal. This is all quotes from the uh, Time Mag- Life magazine article. Was it Life? Did I say Life or Time? What did I say? Life magazine. Remember, Life magazine was the biggest thing back then. Everyone read Life. So Lieutenant, Ger- Lieutenant General Clarence Eaker, he was the commanding general of the 8th Air Force in 1942-44. to 44. He was awarded a bomb in a pickle barrel trophy once he had retired to recognize his role in the strategic bombing campaigns of World War II. Another reference to it can be found in uh, a 1945 edition of Popular Science. And they were talking about, um, a soldier was talking about detailing the the, the chaos surrounding uh, uh, accurately attacking a destroyer. And he says, the glare of the guns and the glare of the bursts uh, blinded him a little, and he couldn't see. So, at, at, quote, at the last second, he looked out again at the destroyer, now clearly silhouetted, holding the bomb release button, the pickle, in his right hand. He waited to squeeze until his improvised bomb sight told him he couldn't miss. Um, and so that's so that's one of the earliest uses of it. Uh, some other people uh, reference it to a... Um, in Vietnam the f- slogan was used to drop all ordnance at the same time for either mass effect on a target, or if you were going to uh, do an emergency crash landing, you don't want to crash land with any bombs or any other weaponry on it. Cause otherwise you'll, you'll explode. So they referred to it as pickle your load prior to landing. Uh, and then another message board says that the, the, uh, the stick on an F-15 just has so many switches that it feels like you're holding a pickle, you know, with all the bumps and ridges on it. Um, but it all does seem to stem from World War II and the idea of, of uh, hitting something or dropping something into a pickle barrel. 
So that's called the pickle button. So now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Yo, Joe! So we've got a nice cockpit picture here, and it's Ace spotting uh, the Rattlers. He sees four Cobra Rattlers. And uh, you know, again, because this is Action Force, it's, it's Tally Ho, <laughs> four Cobra Rattlers at three, o'clo- three o'clock. And he asks if they can engage. It's funny. He says, can we engage? And they say, you know, no. Uh, wep, do not fire until fired upon. But because it's, you know, hey, man, we're here for the action, right? We're not here for them to 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 kill time. The next panel they get fired on. So, like, there's no, <laughs> I like that they they put the Cobra in the role of the aggressor, but we're not wasting any, any time. Like, it's your, yeah, the next panel, there's a Rattler, and they've engaged. Um, so, uh, Scarlet's getting, uh, getting shot at by one of the Rattlers. And uh, a missile is fine. Now, this is a great, this, this panel, this third panel on the page, right in the middle. Uh, and it's, these are really large. They're large panels. They're really nice. They're airy because they're in, in the sky. They just use, um, the, the coloring, the blue coloring and their shades of blue. It's really nice coloring, especially for the time. You know, this is, I imagine this, this is pre, um, computer coloring. Uh, it doesn't, you know, like that really wasn't, didn't come to prominence for a couple of years. So I don't imagine they used coloring, computer coloring on this like this. Some really nice work with the blues and the purples um, to highlight certain things. Specifically in the second panel, they do a nice, um, it's almost like a, a, a glow effect on the Conquest to really highlight it. Uh, and in this case, there's a fisheye lens feel to it where this missile is kind of stretching out across the panel curving and it gives you the feel that scarlet is just pulling back on her yoke and um you know on the stick and just like just putting the conquest into a turn to avoid this missile that's what you get by by having this um curve to the picture or well not to the picture curve to the flight path of the missile like the missile itself is even curved it it works really really well and so while she's doing that uh slipstream slips behind the rattler and he uh nails it with his uh, machine guns so that's one Rattler down. Uh, but as Slipstring did that, he picked up his wingman. So now we've got another Rattler flying in. And, and what's amazing about this part of this final panel is Slipstream's recovering. And the other Rattler is now moved in behind him. But the other Rattlers, they, they showed it flying inverted. So you could have easily just drawn, their, you know, the choice could have been just to draw the Rattler literally like moving in behind him at, you know, the same seat, but they've got it inverted, implying that it just made a sweet move, you know, like a, you know, like a, a loop-de-loop move or so to speak to get in line with the conquest. Like it's, it's adding action to the scene without having to show the actual action that's happening. Cause why, why is he inverted? He's inverted because he's making a big move. Yo, Joe! This is the page that I just, uh, I just fell in love with this is this is a great page there's four panels they're huge so break it up into four giant real you know tall panels and um first one real cinematic there there's multiple layers of cloud cover the camera's pointing towards the earth but you don't see you don't see any details on the ground everything's got this bluish shade to it uh and you see one two three there's four four aircraft in this photo um the furthest one to be fair i don't know what it is i think that's it looks like an aircraft it might just be a, a more cloud cover but it, it's kind of in the middle of the page so it, i feel like it has to be an aircraft and frankly what it could be is the um night raven that we're talking about later but either way there's something in the in the distance which catches your eye in almost a direct line uh like a 90 degree from the left corner angling up to the top right, you've got the Conquest, and that's um, Slipstream's Conquest. And then you've got a Rattler doing an inverted power dive on him. So we see the bottom of the Rattler at an at a different angle than, than Slipstream. So that's that same Rattler that we just saw in the previous panel. That's moving in on him. And then Ace and Lady J are in the picture as well, but they're at a completely different angle. They're flying, they're cutting across. You know, if you're, so if you're watching a car drive away from you down the street, and a car drives right in front of you at a 90 degree angle, you know, you're seeing inside their, you're seeing inside their car and they're commenting on those cars that are driving completely away from them. So that's the effect we get here. Uh, and, uh, 
and that is another bandit. That actually, that is, I am actually looking at the, if I read the captions, I would have known that little bandit in the bottom is the fifth bandit. Uh, that is the night Raven that we'll see on the next page. So Lady J confirms that. So that's, it's just nice framing on this and the clouds really looks great. And there's enough room in the panel to give this airy feel. It's not crowded. There's just an air of, um, there's a space in this. It's nice. Moving to the next panel. This one is straight out of like enemy ace era stuff. It's awesome. Um, you've got two rattlers. They're headed towards the sky striker. And uh, their cam- the camera's placed behind them on the same plane as they are. And they're heading into the Sky Striker at a, like, kind of a 90-degree angle. So Ace is about to get picked up on. It's, it's, it's just a... And, and all of it is at a cockeyed uh, Dutch tilt to the Earth. So you got the Earth, like the, the, um, the mountains in the distance all of a sudden enter this picture. They've been in the sky for almost this entire issue. Now all of a sudden you see that they're close enough to the earth through this, through the cloud cover that there's, you know, mountains in the distance and there's the ground, there's the ocean. And, um, and then that gives you a real nice grounding of, you know, where they're at in relation to, to the earth. Like when I said earlier that, uh, talking about the inverted position of the, um, of the Rattler, Technically, we don't know how inverted he is because there's no bearing on the planet Earth. Have using uh, the mountain range in the back to kind of give us a, a perspective of where these planes are at. Brilliant, really nice. Uh, so we know that Ace is going to be in trouble. So now Scarlet picked off the Rattler that was following Slipstream from the previous panel, and then in uh, Scarlet's like, "All right, we got him. You know, we got to get out of here. You know, I'm getting scared." And and it's just funny, like. Scarlet, like, starts, her saying, starting to scare the life out of me. Ah, it's not Scarlet, but it's action for Scarlet. We'll say that. Um, but then Slipstream says that uh, he's hunting the fifth bandit. Talking about Ace. Ace is hunting the fifth bandit, but the other Rattlers were right behind him. So Ace is heading towards that other bandit that Lady J picked up on her radar. And these guys know that he's got two Rattlers on his tail. Yo, Joe! So, with the introduction of land in that previous panel we talked about, now we're flying, you know, map of the earth, right? Larry wrote about that a lot in, in a lot of his, his his comics where, you know, you fly so low, you're following the earth, you're not going to be picked up on radar. That's what the Joes were supposed to do for the Norway thing. Turns out that's literally what this Night Raven is doing. That's what the, that's what this whole mission is. They're they're spying on the Joes and uh, or action force rather. So now we're above the ocean. So now for the first time, there's a, uh, uh, a, it's a dude in them. It's a tiny little dinghy. And what's funny is he comes into play a couple, he gets, he gets rocked out of his boat here. And then later on, <laughs> so if you're paying attention, this, this is the other member of our, of our cast, but there's no close ups. It's just a guy getting thrown out of his boat as the sky striker, uh, flies overhead. Uh, and Ace thinks he's shaking the Rattlers, uh, but they've lost the Lone Ranger, so to speak. So they, they've lost track of the Night Raven. And remember, Night Ravens are very fast. They're faster than probably all the Joe Jets at this point. Um, meanwhile, but hey, second panel, Ace, again, tally-ho. Uh, at 2 o'clock, they, they, find, they put eyes on the, on the Night Raven. So at the same time, at 12 o'clock, here comes the Rattler. So the Rattlers overshot Ace. The other Rattlers getting in the mix too. Except Ace is able to nail the overshot Rattler, but the second Rattler gets Ace. And these are smaller panels. And because this is a little more, we need to go beat, beat, beat for action. So you bring it smaller. And Staz still finds a way to um, keep the action very clear it's really the panels are really still very open because these planes, when you're drawing them, they're so thin and narrow. They don't take up a lot of the page. So it is taken up by, by uh, the river, the sky and, and the the coloring on this is really doing so much of the heavy lifting on this. It's really great. Um, And they get peppered with uh, some uh, machine gun fire. So they don't get hit with a missile. They're not out of it yet, but he did get them. 
Uh, so the, uh, I keep saying, I want to say X-Wing, the Sky Striker is damaged. And the final panel's neat because the final panel is from the cockpit of the Rattler. And for the first time, the background changes. It's been, the whole thing has been these hues of blue, blue sky, blue water. Like literally, literally the color blue has been every, every actual panel. But this is a moment of distress. This is a panel of Ace is about to bite it. There's crosshairs on it. Um, we never really, we don't see the pilot of the Rattler. Like, I don't want you know, can't say it's Wild Weasel or anything. We don't see the pilot, but this is danger. And so what is the background? It's not the blue sky anymore. It is bright orange, red. They're still doing great work with the coloring as far as gradient use. Um, but it's red and that's not happened. The only other time we've seen red are the, where there have been explosions, which you get on the next page. Yo, Joe! And it's the Rattler exploding because these two uh, conquests fly right out, like past it. So the conquests took out that final Rattler, and that's a very that's a very Star Wars moment for me. That's a very much um, you know uh, Yahoo, you're all clear, kid moment where Falcon shows up and and knocks out the remaining. Uh, well, the Falcon and Wedge show up and they knock out the remaining Tie Fighters and let Luke do his thing. Um, so we got a nice explosion in the middle and it's the same color red as was used in that previous panel. So that's, it's still the danger, except it's, it's, it's an explosion. So it's closed in by like, by literally the black outline of the explosion. Right. So it's like, uh, it's like danger contained previous panel. Danger was everywhere because it was, it was only the border of the panel that closed it in. Maybe I'm overthinking that, but I really, really love it. Next panel, we see the sky striker is in trouble. Uh, they're going to limp home, but they tell the Conquest, just go get the Night Raven. So the Sky Striker's out of the chase. And the Night Raven, turns out, is heading towards that Norwegian station, which we revisited again in the second panel. And the, the drawing of the Night Raven zooming overhead is so good. It is so low to the ground. Uh, think of like a worm's eye view camera. It's looking up. You're seeing the underbelly of the, of the Night Raven as it zooms overhead. There's enough backwash in the distance behind the um, like behind where the jets would be and the trees are raked out. So it, it gives the sense of motion without adding superficial speed lines. Like, you know, in a comic book, you use speed lines to show this person came from that direction. In this case, he's literally just using these distorted trees to show movement. And that works so well because it's the night Raven. What's the night Raven supposed to be? It's supposed to be super stealthy. It's supposed to be super quiet, right? So the less speed lines used, the less, you know, whoosh is, the better. Um, along those lines, if you look back through the dogfighting, there are whooshes, there are, you know, um, explosion lines as they fly through the clouds. There's, there's lines of movement. And you don't get that on the Night Raven because that's how sleek the Night Raven is. It's such a subtle thing to do. It's almost like it's, it's just not there, but it obviously is. But it's, it's not because it's not disturbing the air to make that it's only this, like the secondary things are getting disturbed, uh, which carries over into, uh, when it escapes and it's over the water. And it was also disturbing the water too there, but it's not disturbing the air. You know, I think that's a really neat choice. Um, so they realize that the Joes realize that he got a bunch of pictures of the, of the, um, Norwegian station. So they got to get him before he gets away. And remember this is before, You'd like the pictures literally were photos, right? They were literal snapshots taken on film over, you know, that are that's stored on the on the uh, on the plane. Like if you were telling the story now, as soon as he took that shot, like well, one, they'd be in satellite, but let's just say it would had to be an airplane uh, that would still be like uploaded to a server. And as soon as it got the look, it, that's it, ball game, right? So in this case. They got away with what they wanted to do, but now they the Joe still have an opportunity to stop them because they can catch them. But if he gets away, then the the goose is cooked, which is neat because it, it just adds another element of conflict of we got to stop him here. Well, we didn't do that. We failed. We still have one more chance to stop him. So there's other these uh, more stepping stones to victory there. Um, if you were telling this modern day, you'd have to figure out some different ones. So now it's escaping back down uh, the the river the same way it came or the fjord as they said earlier. Yeah! Joe! zooming over the river and sure enough the guy in the boat gets knocked off again <laughs> it's so good um 
And as it like as it cuts through this fjord and it's about to hit the open ocean, it's about to take off. Like that's what they know. They they're gonna they're gonna be out of luck. However, Ace was Ace and Lady J. They were heading back home, right? So they're basically retracing their steps. So what happens is the Night Raven runs into Ace on the way home, and now we get some turbulence lines being drawn on the night raven why because it's breaking cover now it's climbing it's now radar detectable it's it's you know it's doing its thing it's it's getting up into the stratosphere so it would be caught on rate it would be interrupting the airflow you know what i'm saying when it flies straight it's super silent but now it's making um you know it's making noise so to speak in the air so now you get a lot of speed lines and now it's being drawn like any other plane uh but in doing so they cross paths with literally with cross paths with ace uh and as he turns in front of the conquest, because the conquests are also chasing him, but from a different direction, Ace uh, pickles a missile, uh, and so does so does uh, Slipstream and uh, Scarlet. One of them, I don't know who's who. One of them shoots a missile, and then one of them shoots their uh, machine guns. I guess we, we could go back and figure it out uh, who fired more missiles, but. Uh, not sure who fired what based on the next page in the order they show them Scarlet shot a missile and uh, Slipstream used his machine guns but either way Yo, Joe! on the next panel big old explosion a frack a frack a choom and the uh, uh, Night Raven is just blown to bits. A nice little explosion. It's all fragmenting into pieces. It's really good. Also they were smart enough to not draw the Night Raven with the uh, the mini jet on top because you wouldn't have that on for this kind of mission, right? You'd want it to be as stealthy as possible. So there's no mini jet on top of the Night Raven. And then there's a nice three panel shot of all the pilots faces. And they're all saying at the same time, the same word balloon got him, right? So they all think that they got him. They all fired at the same time and they all, you know, it's like everyone took a shot at the goal and all three pucks went in and, uh, you know, so now they're flying home. And in this case, when they're flying home, in this final panel, they're all, all three are pictures. Uh, one of them says, one of the X thirties says, uh, I thought you were going home. And Ace is like, I was trying to, um, the sky strikers in the front. And why? Cause it proved it's metal it proved that there's still some life left in this old bird. The sky striker can still handle its own. So now it's leading the pack on the way home. Yo, Joe! And later one final wrap up page on the, uh, the aircraft carrier and the USS flag, which one, we don't get enough flag in these comic book stories. Okay. Uh, but two, this drawing is gorgeous. And again, this feels straight out of top gun. Like literally I would not be surprised if he was put on top gun and pause some scenes. It's a really nice shot, really level, uh, like the, um, it's like the horizon line is completely flat and completely in line with the deck of the aircraft carrier. You got a couple X thirty or, or sorry, you got a couple sky strikers on the cover, and then a um uh, we get a nice little uh, guest appearance by the tomahawk, the JJO tomahawk. It's flying towards us off the uh, the deck of the of the carrier, and the sun setting. It's it's nice. It's a nice little sh- photo and. We now, uh, with the sun setting, now the whole sky's red. So, like, the it's just a different time of day. And we say it's not every day you get to shoot down a Cobra Night Raven. And so someone else said that. It sounds like Scarlet said that. And uh, Ace is leaning up against the Sky Striker. says, you shot down the Night Raven. I think Hawk will have a few things to say about that. And Hawk comes walking by. And who's he with? Is he with, uh, oh, yeah, he's with Slipstream. He says, quite right, Ace. Remember, British. We've looked at the gun camera film from all the aircraft and we can't tell who made the kill shot. Sorry, but you're going to have to share the kill between you. So Scarlet's like a lousy quarter of a kill after all that effort. Well, Scarlet, that's your piece of the action. That's it. That's piece of the action. Um, It's a good story. It's really fun. Again, you, you see what I'm saying? Where it's got that little moral like that. You know, like, oh, we wrapped it up and just that for a quarter piece of a kill. Um, it's good. I like it. It's so good. And the, I'm telling you, I'm telling you guys, look at if you've uh, if you have this book, crack it open and check it out. The artwork's gorgeous. It's really, really nice. Daz Johnson kills it with this. Uh, yeah, it just seems really reference heavy and good for him because it's the right way to approach uh, a story where all of your characters are these inanimate objects you know these planes brought a lot of life to them and they look really really good so thumbs up from this guy 
All right. So we'll see you next week for something. Not sure what yet, but uh, it'll be exciting. And you'll be here, and I'll be here. And now you, Joe, enjoying is half the battle. Thank <laughs> you.